Hello and welcome to the CEC report for the 29th of January 2016. I'm Richard Barden and joining me today is CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Richard. So on today's show, US epidemic of overdoses and suicides is the real state of the union and a true republic is more than just an Australian head of state. So first, the US epidemic of overdoses and suicides is the real state of the union. So the State of the Union is an annual address by the United States President to the Congress that's been for a number of years televised live um, across the country. And this is what Barack Obama said after his opening remarks. Let me start with the economy, he said, and a basic fact. The United States of America right now has the strongest, most durable economy in the world. We're in the middle of the longest streak of private sector job creation in history, more than 14 million new jobs, the strongest two years of job growth since the 90s, an employment rate cut in half. Our auto industry has just had its best year ever, and that's just part of a manufacturing surge that's created nearly 900,000 new jobs in the past six years. And he went on to say, anyone claiming that the American economy is in decline is peddling fiction. <laughs> so as usual, Craig Obama was lying. Mm. <laughs> That's right. Now, what's really going on in the United States? Well, we covered back in uh, November um, in our Australian Alert Service some of the, um, the real conditions on the ground, the unemployment, um, the collapse of manufacturing despite Mr Obama's claims to the contrary and that's still going on. Um, there's a number of news articles floating around that state that all of the major um, industrial manufacturers, heavy machinery manufacturers, their sales are dropping, their inventories, they're not even replacing them, there's no point. Well I think the, I think the, uh, the important thing Richard is this question of unemployment. In the US, right, if you've been on uh, unemployment benefits, benefits for I think about six months. Mm -hmm. You're no longer considered unemployed, yeah. even if you haven't found a job. So when he talks about 5% unemployment, it's actually a complete fraud. Yeah. Because it's actually more like 40%. Uh, 40 Between so, un unemployment and underemployment. Yeah, yeah. something like 93 million people in the US don't have a job or have an income less than 15000 mm. per year. And you can't live on that. Yeah. And what happened this last week, which is uh, well, actually the end of last year, but also uh, in this last week, is the New York Times actually picked up on one of the indicators mm. of the collapse of the economy, and that is the increase of the death rates due to drug over overdoses. Mm. And they published a spectacular uh, set of graphs in the New York Times on the front page. Front I mean, this page, is really, sorry. <laughs> really quite substantial, uh, yeah, quite stunning. The actual collapse that you see from drug overdoses, particularly from heroin. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a, a crisis in this country with crystal meth, methamphetamine. In the US, what they actually do, which is really quite stunning, is they break down their figures county by county. So they get actual figures of death rates per 100,000, which is what you see on these graphs. Yeah, and, and we can put one of those, uh, some of those graphs up on the screen here. You can really see that this, is, this really is an epidemic. And that's coming from, not from us, that's coming from the Centers for Disease Control yeah. and Prevention in the United States. So what the Times did was they analyzed uh, nearly 60 million death certificates collected by CDC from 1990 to 2014. And then they've plotted the uh, 2002 to 2014 results on these graphs. And uh, yeah, their, their um, directors the deputy director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse was quoted in the New York Times saying that this really is an epidemic. It's along the lines of the AIDS epidemic. Well, actually, it's worse. The death rates are rising faster mm. than the AIDS epidemic, which you, know, you would have thought back in the 80s. I mean, that was really quite shocking back then. But now with these drug overdoses, the death rates amongst particularly the... Um, uh, you know, have, have absolutely jumped enormously. For example, um, the death rates in 2003 were just nine people per 100,000. Now mm -hmm. it's 15 per 100,000 across the board. Yeah. But then you've got different, uh, particularly amongst the, uh, the younger generations, the rates are even more yeah. stunning. The, the, right. uh, the generation 25 to 34, their, uh, their death rate has actually gone up 500%. The deaths 
uh, per the deaths from suicides and drug overdoses. Yeah, I think the the um, this story was broken by our, our, our counterparts in the US, the uh, LaRouche Pack, uh, and I would encourage people to go to the LPAC website and actually look at the full address given covering this particular uh, story because it gives much more detail than we can do in this in this segment mm -hmm. today. But one of the things I want to come back to, Richard, is that this is not an accident. No. Uh, this policy, this death rate increase, is not an accident. It goes back to not just Obama, but back into the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. So you've had 15 years of policies that have basically destroyed the physical economy in the United States. And people should be thinking about this from the point of view of what's happened here in Australia. Mm -hmm. And actually this coincides with the takedown of the Glass-Steagall in 1999-2000 period under Clinton, unfortunately. So after the Clinton administration came in, uh, uh, finished, you had the Bush and you've had the Obama administration. So you've had 15 years of policies that have been directed at basically pro-banker free trade policies. Mm. And that's destroyed the physical economy that actually keeps people not just uh, you know, able to get by day to day, but actually inspires people to you know, to go to work, to, to look for ways to improve their lot, <coughs> excuse me, and, you know, the economy of the nation, that, that's been taken away from them. And that, that policy came top down. I mean, when you take away, take away the principles of Glass-Steagall, and what's Glass-Steagall? Glass-Steagall is the re-regulation or the control of the banking system, whereby you have a highly regulated commercial banking system where it's protected and you use that to drive the real physical economy, which employs people. And one of the markers that you've got with this high unemployment is, as I said before, the, the fact that people become destitute, they become locked out of the economic cycle, they can't provide for their kids, they become desperate, and then, of course, the pain is great, and they do tend to turn to drugs, and that's what's been demonstrated here. Yeah. So what you've had back in 2000, and as demonstrated by the massive growth in global speculation through the derivatives bubble that we talk about a lot on this show, mm is a shift away from supporting the physical economy, real jobs, real infrastructure, into supporting the, f the, the, the global financial casino, which of course crashed, crashed in 2008. Yeah. And supporting it at all costs, which is the other thing that I uh, wanted you to comment on, because this surge, as, you can, as people will have seen from those graphs, it really accelerated under the Obama administration. But again, that's not a coincidence, that, because if you go back to 2010, there was a bank, uh, well, an amalgamated bank, um, Wells Fargo Wachovia, uh, entered into a non-prosecution agreement um, with the Obama Justice Department when they got caught out laundering drug money. HSBC, a couple of years later, the same thing. And the reason that they gave from th for that is, we can't prosecute these banks, we can't send these people to jail, the directors of these banks, as they deserve, because that would threaten global financial stability. Yeah, too big to fail. Yeah, too In big other to words, fail. Too, actually, too big to jail. To something. jail, <laughs> yeah. And so Glass-Steagall, when we talk about that, it's not a cure-all in and of itself, but with that in place, there would be no threat to financial stability if these people were treated as the criminals that they are and given the punishment that they deserve. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's no accident that you have a rise in the drug rates because, look, the biggest financial backer of Obama, the guy that supported Obama into the White House was George Soros. Mm. Now we've written a lot about George Soros over the last 15 to 20 years because George Soros actually is what we call a global drug pusher. He is supporting the, the, the uh, legalization of marijuana. He's, he's put billions of, or millions of dollars into this pro programs around the world to legalize drugs. Mm. And consequently and, and starting today, with marijuana, but a lot of these guys said they want all drugs to be legal, you know, the ultimate free market model, whatever you want and can pay for, you should be able to get, they yeah. say. And as you found, many banks, HSBC, for example, Wells Fargo, as you've said, these guys have been caught red-handed supporting the global drug trade, mm -hmm. support, laundering the, the billions, if not trillions, most of trillions of dollars that underpin the global casino economy but they can't be prosecuted now because they're too big to fail. And this is the problem, is that if we keep, keep trying to protect these, these bankers, and how are they protecting themselves now? Well, we've, again, if people watch our program on a regular basis, they'll hear that we talk about this concept of bail-in. Mm. Well, bail-in has become the law, international law, 
uh, particularly in the European Union countries and also other countries around the world, whereby the bankers now have the right to steal your deposits. So instead of going back to a regulated banking system like with Glass-Steagall, where governments take control of the banks and they say, no, you're, you, you have a certain licence to operate in this field, therefore you have to be regulated, but you can only operate within these rules, it's been total free trade deregulation and you've seen the collapse of the physical economy accordingly because they've been allowed to take depositors' funds and have been allowed to speculate openly mm. into things like derivatives and, and all sorts of very uh, casino-like financial mm. instruments collapsing the physical economy. Yeah. And as we've seen in Europe recently, suicides directly because of that, because of the bank's actions, have uh, you know, come to the attention of uh, various law, enforcements, uh, law enforcement agencies and governments who are, there's talk of launching formal investigations of this and we can hope that they go ahead. But um, in the meantime, um, we've run out of time uh, on that subject, but do call in for a copy of the Australian Alert Service newsletter. Uh, that goes through all this in much more detail and we'll take a break there and when we come back we'll talk about what a real Australian Republic will be. Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing that a true Republic means more than an Australian head of state. So in the media in the last few days, beginning probably on the 25th, the day before Australia Day, we've had all this renewed chatter about when are we going to become a republic, what kind of republic are we going to have, um, because of course Malcolm Turnbull is the former leader of the Australian Republican movement so-called, but uh, back in 1999, Craig, the CEC was heavily involved in a campaign, even though we're as republican as you can get, um, we were heavily involved in a campaign to stop Turnbull's model of a republic from coming in. And um, so why don't you just um, explain to the viewers what that was all about? Well, let me ask you a question, Richard, or maybe the viewers a question. Now, have they heard of people like John Dunmore Lang, Charles Harper, Adelaide Ironside, Daniel Dennehy, George Black, John Fitzgerald, William Spence, King O'Malley, Frank Anstey, maybe you would have heard about that. We talked about him. Jack Lang, of course, people know, and John Curt. Mm. I would now, venture to say that most of those names wouldn't be familiar to well, uh, people, especially our newer viewers. Well, back in 1995, that's nearly yeah, that's over 20 years ago, right? We had a look at our organisation and said, well, what's our real history? Because this, back then in 1995, there was discussion about a republic, and we said, well, do we don't really understand our full history. Did we have a republican movement? Is, you know, what, what is our history? Or do we have to believe everything the British Empire wants to throw on us, right? So we began an enormous research project, um, which involved many, many hours in the National Library and so forth, to find out what is the actual history of, our, of Australia. And what we found out was that we had an extraordinarily strong republican movement in the 1850s, 1860s and thereabouts, 1870s and forward, which was aligned very closely to the tremendous optimism around the likes of Abraham Lincoln and so forth mm. and what took place in the defeat of the Confederacy and the enormous uh, renaissance that took place in America around his leadership. Now, a lot of these figures that I mentioned had a very close rapport with a lot of these, uh, the, uh, a lot of the American figures at that time and the optimism that came from America, from that pro-industrial, pro-development uh, idea, was brought back via gold rushes and people coming into Australia so that we had a very strong Republican movement here. In fact, there was actually discussion about Australia becoming a republic calling itself the United States of Australia. Mm. We had a constitution at that point towards a, uh, that, that idea but the British that regarded Australia as a crucial, crucial uh, economic and strategic outpost could not allow us to move in that direction. So what happened was that they actually took the constitution that was very much modelled on what was in the United States constitution mm -hmm. and the Home Office in Britain rewrote that constitution and gave us a form of government called responsible government, mm. whereby the ministers were appointed, well, basically swore allegiance to the Crown. And still do. And still do. And... Consequently, uh, the real power lies not in representatives that are committed to the people, but representatives that are actually committed to the Crown. So we have a Governor-General, that's, that's her first priority is actually to the Queen. Mm -hmm. We have Ministers that swear allegiance to the Queen 
first and foremost, and are appointed by the Governor General under the Constitution. So we were given a form of government that stripped away our sovereignty. And this is a very important point because in 1993, when I met uh, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, physical economist and statesman Lyndon LaRouche, he was actually framed up by George Bush and put into prison because he, as one of the, the original American Republican, in the tradition, the American Republicans, not the Republican Party, but the, mm, but the real, yeah, real the Republicans. The Republican Party isn't worthy of the no, name no, anymore. The real, but the real thinkers that support the concept of the general welfare and real economic development. Uh, he, he made a very clear comment to me. He says, the problem with Australians, Craig, is that you guys don't understand the difference between being autonomous and being sovereign. Mm. You're very happy to be autonomous under the crown, but that is not the same thing as being sovereign where you can actually determine your own future. And this is what we see in Australia. It's what you see, we see with the Malcolm Turnbull debate is that they're very happy to give us a minimalist or limited mm. republic. Yeah. Don't touch the financial powers. Don't touch the real... Uh, structures that govern a country, don't have a national bank, don't have an elected state, uh, mm -hmm. represent a head of state, for example. And that was one of the big issues in 1999. Yep. So we produced the history of Australia. It's called A Fight for an Australian Republic from the First Fleet to the year 2000. And if anyone wants to know anything about or even be remotely serious about what actually a true republic is if, uh, here, here in Australia, you have to go back and look at our history. Because by looking at our history and the fight that was fought back in the 1850s, 60s, 70s and through to the time that we actually got given a federal model, uh, you don't fully understand what the real battles are and you actually see the true nature of the crown coming forward as what we have to bat battle today. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a meeting coming up uh, tomorrow, today, I think, uh, in, today. in Sydney, which is uh, really representative of the, <laughs> the problem we <laughs> exactly have with this the question problem we have. So we'll, um, we'll take a break there and we'll uh, continue discussing this uh, afterwards. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're discussing a true republic is more than just an Australian head of state. So before the break, Craig, we were talking about um, some of the history of the republican movement in Australia going back to the 1850s and how that forced the British Empire to uh, compromise to the extent that they gave us federation, but federation under the crown. And um, in 1999, Mr. Malcolm Turnbull, who's, uh, who uh, was a Goldman Sachs partner at the time, led the Republican movement to try to basically keep the model of government that we have, but have a parliamentary uh, a president appointed by the parliament rather than a yeah. popularly elected president. And that's not really, that's not really a republic at all, it, is it? It was a remunerous approach. They didn't want to touch the constitution because they figured people would freak out and so forth. But see, that's not, that's not what's required here for a true republic in Australia. We actually have to ditch any association we've had with the British Empire. And that requires a massive shift in terms of people's thinking. It means us actually becoming sovereign for once instead of being uh, hanging on to mum, queens, coattails, mm -hmm. which is mentally actually what people do. Yep. They're terrified about the idea that somehow we aren't capable as Australians of governing our own affairs. We need to have structures in place that protect us <laughs> from ourselves. And this yep. is the mentality you see from the constitutional monarchists, is they don't fully get the idea that a republic has a higher principle at stake. And you look mm. at that in the best aspects of the US Republic, where people like Benjamin Franklin and Franklin Roosevelt in modern times actually fought for what's called the general welfare, the, the, this concept of fighting for the life, liberty and the true, uh, pursuit of happiness, which is translated in the idea that government is of, for and by the people to support the people and the general welfare of the people. Yep. Today we've got of, for, you know, for, of, of, for and uh, by, by the bankers effect, yep. in effect. And, and um, that's what Malcolm Turnbull is sort of paradigmatic is. Now he might get better if Australia falls into you know, massive financial turmoil, he might be struck with the fact that he's in a responsible position there to be actual care for Australians. Mm. That's, un that's not seen yet, but his pedigree of being a Goldman Sachs boy, a merchant banker and so forth, I'm afraid doesn't give me too much hope mm. in terms of where he's going to actually take this country. No, especially not with a meeting that's happening today, which we mentioned before the break. Um, it's unprecedented, they say, in the history of Australia. Now, we might 
challenge that based on some of the things that went on back in the 1930s, but we don't have time to get into that now. People can look up on our website um, from our conference from last year. But uh, today at the Sydney Opera House, there's a meeting uh, happening between Malcolm Turnbull, uh, Scott Morrison, the Treasurer, Andrew Robb, the Trade Minister, and a number of others with uh, Australian and global corporate um, outfits, including what they call global investors. They're, they're wooing foreign investment in this country. And the first on the list is BlackRock, the biggest, the biggest uh, capital manager in the world with uh, something like 4.6 trillion US dollars under management. Um, and this is all, as you were saying before the break, based on a fraud that we need to have some kind of you know, money supply from somewhere else. Well, it's interesting, you know, I was talking about King O'Malley, it was one of those names, that, but those people I named before. King O'Malley established Australia's Commonwealth Bank. We uh, have a model of the Commonwealth Bank that we've talked about many times on this show, and we've got actual videos on our website of presentations that we've done to show that we don't need people, you know, these, these, these private parasitical hedge funds and equity funds coming in, buying up our infrastructure, and then making us pay the tolls mm. and the uh, for the rights to use it. Now, that's this is the nature and the direction that these global equity funds are pulling the world because of the failure of governments to be sovereign and to institute the policies necessary to protect the people. Mm. And I want to caveat this all by saying that this has got nothing to do with economics. This actually has got to do with what we've talked many times on this show about actual global population reduction. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the head of the, uh, the, the City of London, or the, you know, the British Empire in particular, is very closely tied to the City of London. Prince Philip, the Queen, have come out and made very clear that they intend and they want the world's population to drop from 7 billion down to below 1 billion people. How are you going to do that? Were well, you going to do that by cutting off people's access to real physical economic infrastructure? Cut off people's access to real high paying good jobs or actually having jobs as we've seen in the previous segments. In the US you've seen the collapse of the physical economy and the, the massive rise of the, the, the people killing themselves with drugs. That is not an accidental policy, Richard. No. That is actually a deliberate policy. George Soros is a, uh, an asset of the British Empire, of the, of the Crown. That's, un, that, that's undisputed. We've yeah. got the material on that yeah. you know, The man everywhere. who backed Barack so, Obama into office. That's, that's what I said. agenda, yeah, as you were saying before. That's what I'm saying. That's what, what worries me about Malcolm Turnbull. Now look at this, this meeting that's taking place in Sydney. Mm -hmm. We'll say more about it as we go along, uh, once it's happened and so forth. His pedigree is that of a merchant banker. He's been put in there, we believe, you know, because the entire Australian political system is run by the private bankers, mm -hmm. unless we have people of the courage of King O'Malley, of John Curtin, of people like Ben Chifley, for example, that take on this issue and bring back Glass-Steagall, bring back a commitment to a national banking, which we've had in deep history here in Australia, and large infrastructure development, Richard, this country is going to go down very, very fast, and we're going to have an increasing rate of uh, disease and death, as we've seen in the United States. Yep. And there's absolutely no need for it. Um, we've actually already written the legislation to enact a Commonwealth National Credit Bank, um, which again, people can find on our website, but we've run out of time for this week. So thanks for- As we do always. <laughs> as we do. So thank you for watching. Do call in for a copy of your uh, free Australian alert service and read more about this and we'll see you next week.